Hello, and welcome to our panel on issues facing freelancers, right? freelance writers, uh, hosted by the Freelancers Union and uh, Dingy. This is the first of a series of events that we're planning to do uh, to host focused on freelancers in different event industries. Because we, while we know that most freelance issues are the same for everyone, things like getting paid on time, paying your taxes, managing your career, uh, we also know that each industry has its own unique challenges. So we're starting things off with writers, which I personally couldn't be happier about. Um, I'm the communications director for Freelancers Union, but before I joined the union, I was actually a freelance journalist, an editor, and a copywriter for about a decade. So I've got lots of my own experience to bring to this, and I'm sure we'll get into it. Um, but we're also going to talk about what we've heard from our members and obviously what our panelists have experienced. Speaking of panelists, we've got some really great people here to talk with us today. Um, We've got Wu Dan Yan, who's a freelance journalist and podcaster. We've got Umer Kazi from the Authors Guild, Ryan Goldberg of the Freelance Solidarity Project, and Rob Hartley, who's co-founder of Dingy, which is a partner that we work with to provide liability insurance that's specifically for freelance writers. So the way things are going to go today is I'm first going to speak to each of the panelists individually. They each have a unique subject area that we're going to touch on a little bit, and then we're going to bring everybody on to have a little bit of group discussion and also some Q&A. So if you have questions as our panelists are speaking, please drop them into the YouTube chat. We'll be keeping an eye on that, and I'll try to pull as many of those in as we can during the Q&A session. So we'll get things started with um, with Wudan. If we're all ready, I'll pull her in. Uh, just for a little bit more intro, she's an independent journalist based in Seattle. She has work in The Atlantic, New York Magazine, and The New York Times, among many others. Uh, and she's also the co-founder of The Writers Co-op, which is a business podcast for freelance creatives. Hi, Wudan. How you doing? Hi, Regan. I'm good. How are you? Great. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah. So I wanted, I wanted to kick things off uh, with you because you've got such a uh, kind of interesting freelance career and you've really done a lot. You work also with other freelance writers to, to manage their careers and help them along that path. So I guess just to kick things off, can you talk a little bit about how you got here, sort of how your career has evolved, how you got started as a freelance writer? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been freelancing as a journalist for a little over seven years. I think this is year eight onward, which I'm almost out of that early career mindset trap or, or the number that we assign to early career writers. Uh, I have a background in science. I was not trained as a journalist. I am self-taught. Um, and, you know, when I came into journalism, I saw a lot of staff jobs. And when I realized that staff jobs wanted, even at minimum for very entry level positions, three or five years of experience. I didn't know how I was going to get that if not for freelancing because I didn't go to a program. I didn't have a name or institution to hang my name on. Um, and so I began freelancing. And around that five, uh, three to five year mark, I realized that I really love freelancing. I was getting the stories that I wanted to do commission. I was getting major fellowships and grants to support my reporting. And so I've basically continued on. Um, the biggest development over the last year and a year and a half is that I started the Writers Co-op. The Writers Co-op is a business podcast for freelance creatives and also a membership program. So we have over, I want to say 200-ish members on Patreon um, who get free resources. The season of the podcast uh, is basically all listener and subscriber supported. Um, and so as, as a subscriber, you get the episodes two week in advance of everyone else when it goes live on Spotify and YouTube, things of that sort. Um, it's a interesting story of why the Writers Co-op started and I run it with Jenny Gritters, who is also a Pacific Northwest based freelance writer and editor. Uh, we met in Seattle and we quickly realized that we were both swapping a lot of business decisions uh, by text. And um, when Jenny went freelance, because she was laid off from a job, the first year she freelanced, she made six figures. She wrote uh, a Medium post, it went viral. Um, similarly, around the same time, I was going through a lot of late payment stuff and I had three clients who owed me around $5,000 and it was all late. I decided to ding them all with late fees. So about 20% of the fee um, on top of what I owed. 
And then I wrote about the experience and self-published it uh, first on Medium, and now it lives on a permanent link on my website. So you can, I'll drop it in the chat um, at some point. And so that also went viral. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, people started coming to me for advice and people were already running to Jenny for advice on how to build their freelance businesses. And we realized that our time and attention isn't scalable. Uh, that's why we decided to launch a podcast. So the Writers Co-op, we've had um, two seasons so far, just launching the third one. Um, first season was the brass tacks of how to set up a freelance business, how to say no, when to say no, contracts. Um, season two, we interviewed other successful freelance writers on how they run their businesses. We, I think there's a lot to learn from each other too. Um, and season three, we are going to be coaching other freelancers who are at a juncture of their career and want to do something different in their business. Um, so that's a brief rundown of kind of where I've been uh, this past year. We also recently created courses um, on business basics and how to we really want to train other freelancers to empower themselves on how to read, negotiate um, and navigate media contracts. So we also have that as well available now. I think that's really interesting the way you you and Jenny both kind of found yourselves in this in this mentor like position just by dint of talking about your own experiences right you both mm -hmm. had these posts where you just kind of described a, a juncture in your career a moment that you faced and how you dealt with it and and found so many people kind of flock to it just because they really didn't they didn't have that kind of community understanding i think that's one of the real issues that that i felt as a freelance writer and and we hear a lot from people it's just like you know unless you have that writer community you have other freelance writers that you can turn to and say like hey is this normal should this be happening or like how do we deal with this mm -hmm. um you can really feel kind of out there on your own what are have you noticed any you know in in the interviews that you've done with the the writers co-op have you noticed any kind of common situations that people keep bringing up those kind of moments of mm -hmm. Should this be happening? <laughs> yeah, I also run a private coaching business and on uh, as a membership option for the Writers Co-op, we have group coaching and for a while we had one-on-one -on -one coaching too. Um, one of the things I see consistently happening is how writers undervalue themselves because we don't, um, the way that we are d d trained, socialized to think about pricing is completely wrong. Um, so I come from journalism and I think it's correct to say that um, it's kind of a dying industry in terms of what freelancers are getting paid. And people really have a hard time drawing the line at what payments they will accept. And then they wonder why they're not reaching their business goals. And then how little we are paid in journalism distorts their view of how much they should be charging when they go to other clients. Um, I'm in a lot of writers groups where people say, hey, a, a client, an NGO, a company, a biotech, a startup wants me and wants to hire me to do to produce a certain thing how much should i charge and people are like 30 dollars an hour seems fine and i was like no <laughs> uh it's completely the wrong way to think about pricing as a client buying your time um the client is buying a product which has high value and they are seeking it from you because what you do is valuable so um when people start only thinking that clients are buying their time um that's how you basically are a bad boss to yourself um i think that's how people put themselves out of business because they're not thinking about the value that they're actually providing um i would say that's the co most common issue and then that also ties into issues about confidence and imposter syndrome, which um, are magnified with social media and this digital era of um, publishing, I think, too. I think that's a good way to frame it is don't be a bad boss to yourself, right? Like most freelancers are out here because they maybe they had bad boss experiences and they decided, you know what, forget it. I'm not working for somebody anymore. Or, you know, they saw issues that people dealt in, on staff and just didn't want to deal with it. But you can really very easily end up being just as bad a boss to yourself or worse than somebody else might be because you're holding yourself to these standards that that any reasonable person wouldn't necessarily hold another another person to. Yeah, absolutely. And there's nobody really holding yourself accountable when it's just you. <laughs> right. How is it, how, how are you 
able to talk people through sort of setting those boundaries for yourself? Is it is it just think about as if you were another person and kind of give yourself that distance in your career mm -hmm. or are there other kind of guidelines that you can help people through? I think it's first thinking of yourself as a business. Um, so Jenny talks about this in the first season of the Writers Co-op, but when she was about to go freelancing, her therapist said, uh, or one issue that Jenny brought forth to her therapist was, I'm afraid people aren't going to take me seriously. Her therapist goes, okay, what do you have to do to make people to take you seriously? Jenny was like, I guess I have to start an LLC. Um, so some people start an LLC from the get-go. I've been an LLC for a little over a year. Uh, for me, it wasn't the business mindset. I think I've always had that of diversifying my clients, um, making sure I'm getting paid, negotiating rates, negotiating contracts. Um, but thinking of yourself as a business with benefits, with a retirement plan, with vacation days, with office hours, with non-working time, um, mental health days, sick days, like things that normal employees get, we can also uh, give to ourselves. Um, you know, freelancers say, oh, I can't imagine retiring. I don't make enough money to save for retirement. Well, the math works out too. If you want to uh, bolster your monthly income by $600, um, you can earmark that to go automatic automatically into an IRA. And then you hit, uh, you max out your Roth by the end of the year because that's how math works. Um, so there are subtle things like that that I think is a real mindset shift. Um, this is what I work on a lot with my clients in coaching because a lot of them come from staff jobs or um, don't really have a community. So they don't know what standard they think that, you know, freelancing should be exploitative. They expect freelancing to be certain ways. But uh, without realizing that um, we actually have quite a bit of control over how we run our businesses if we think of ourselves as a business. I think that's really valuable advice. Um, thinking about those sort of early career milestones, you know, you talked about setting up an LLC right away for some people. Are there any kind of, you know, a lot of these decisions can be very personal. What's important to you? How do you feel you, you need to set up your business to take yourself seriously for other people to take you seriously? But are there any kind of steps that you would recommend to, to any early career writer, things that they really ought to do right out the gate to sort of set themselves up for long-term success? Hmm. Um, begin negotiating early. Uh, one thing that we really stress on the podcast and in our individual coaching businesses, mine and Jenny's individual coaching businesses, is that confidence and bravery are muscles. Uh, we exercise them more. They're easier to use in the long term. Um, you know, whether that small negotiation is $50 more on top of a three or 400 word story. Okay, can you work to $100 more on the next time? Okay, are you have you outgrown other clients because they can't pay what you need to? Great. Like, are you moving on to solely a dollar a word? Are you working on project rates uh, in increments of a thousand? I see so many freelancers living in increments of 50 or a hundred dollars. And not only is that not sustainable, but it shows to me, you know, that we, some, we are, we are socialized to think that we should settle for less because if we don't take it, somebody else will, because there's no shortage of writers. Um, and we need that money because we're living in that in that increment style. Um, I just don't think any of that is true. Uh, when I talk about negotiating or breaking out of that, um, people stare at me like I'm a monster with five heads. Um, they're just like, you're already established. How do you know? But I, what I did was basically work my way up to where I am now um, by, by starting low, but every it became a game for me oh i got 300 on this assignment can you get 400 next time okay what about 600 and then all of a sudden it's like wow those lower rates literally never work for me anymore so i'm going to cut that out of my business plan um and i think people stay trapped at a low paying level because they don't negotiate or don't think about it and when the time comes to negotiate it's really scary because that muscle um has never been used or rarely been used when you talk about negotiation, I know obviously pay is the biggest piece of that, but are there other things that, that you think people should sort of practice negotiating for or that can be valuable that maybe we haven't thought about? Yeah, uh, everything is negotiable. Um, and I go into every business arrangement with a potential client. And when I say client, I mean newspaper or magazine, if I'm doing journalism, brands or companies, biotech, startups, whatever, if I'm talking 
other non-journalistic work. I always know um, what I need to be paid for a project and what my walkaway point is. Uh, so for newspapers and magazines, usually my walkaway point has to do with the money. Um, with journalism and magazine, uh, sorry, journalism and magazines, I think about um, not only what I'm getting paid to make sure I'm still hitting my income goals, but also uh, I'm thinking about rights. I'm thinking about indemnity. I am thinking about um, expenses. Can I invoice for my expenses as they are incurred? Uh, transcription has been really speeding up my business and I rely on it heavily. And so, you know, one very low hanging fruit that I ask for is, hey, can you cover this transcription? It's for an hour and on Temi, it's going to be around $15. Um, so just like negotiating basically anything, negotiating a deadline, if you think it's unreasonable, it's also something to do. And these are, uh, you know, these small micro negotiations, which you can be like, that's not real. She's just like asking for somebody to like, be a little nicer. Like those are negotiations and those are small ways to flex that bravery muscle that I talked about. They might be easier ways for some people to start out if they don't feel comfortable asking for that big pay mm -hmm. raise. Maybe they can just get that $15 transcription covered and then next time they feel a little bit stronger. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to move on to our next panelist. Thank you so much for chatting, um, but stay tuned and we're going to bring everybody back in for a uh, discussion and Q&A panel at the end. So thank you so much for now. I'm going to uh, say goodbye to Udan and we're going to bring on Umer Kazi. Umer Kazi is the Director of Policy and Advocacy for the Authors Guild. Um, he's also uh, secretly a writer. He studied creative writing at Columbia University in addition to studying law at the University of Iowa. Uh, Umer, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Regan. Um, I guess, first of all, let's, can we talk a little bit about the Authors Guild in general, sort of who do you serve and what are the sort of main issues that, that you focus on over there? Absolutely. So the Authors Guild is the oldest and largest professional organization of authors in the United States. It's been around since uh, 1912. It started as the Authors League of America and was uh, up, uh, included both playwrights and uh, prose and, and poet. Uh, poetry writers, poetry writers, um, uh, book writers, journalists, uh, basically anyone that works with text uh, was an Authors Guild member and then the playwrights split up and created the Dramatists Guild. Um, we currently have over uh, 10,000 members and um, um, our members span genres and uh, media. Um, a lot of them are um, book writers, traditionally published book writers. But of course, you know, if you're a book writer, um, you, you, you're also doing some freelance journalism. You're also writing for magazines. You might even, um, you know, or, 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 you know, you might be a, 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 a self-employed entrepreneur, like where you might have, we have a lot of members, for instance, that have like coaching programs or like, um, um, uh, a lot of a lot of like self help um, um, uh, training uh, type businesses on the side that are sort of integrated with their uh, writing practice and business. Um, so it's a pretty diverse group. We uh, we we have a, a fair amount of freelance writers as well, and we review contracts uh, from you know pretty much every publication book book contracts. Um, podcast contracts, uh, audiobook contracts. Uh, we have a legal department. We have a, 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 a lawyers who uh, have been doing this for a very long time. And we also and uh, mentioned we should, <laughs> forgot about what I do. Um, uh, we also have an advocacy arm where we we lobby in DC on behalf of authors' rights on issues of uh, um, uh, copyright primarily, um, but also um, uh, uh, collective bargaining is something that we're working on right now um, for 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 authors um, and just uh, the bargaining power that authors have with respect to the buyers of their services. So copyright's really interesting. It's one of the things that, that I wanted to talk to you about directly, because I think a lot of writers, I mean, a lot of people know, they've heard of copyright, you know, like they, they think maybe they understand what it is, but I think a lot of writers who are kind of in the thick of it maybe don't fully understand the value of it, the power of it, what it actually means. Absolutely. So can you give us like the nutshell, the nutshell version? Absolutely, and I and and I'm I, I'm 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 glad uh, um, Budan also mentioned rights uh, and and you know and your questions, which we'll get to. Um, there's there's sort of a different ways to go about it. I and mean, copyright, in a nutshell, is um, probably the most important um, 
it's it's both a right but it's also like ownership of your work i mean it's an important right in the sense that it it uh, in 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 many in in many countries uh it's it's considered an inalienable right like almost like um you know a right of speech so it's a it's a natural right in the united states it, it it's framed both a, a part in some in some respects as a natural right but primarily as an economic right the author's economic right to um, um you know a, 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 a have a limited monopoly over their work uh and then the other part of copyright is uh for the benefit of the public um but um not to get too uh philosophical about copyright <laughs> copyright is actually is actually a bundle of rights and there are six exclusive rights uh, that uh, the creator of a work or an author has um, in their work. And these are um, the right to make copies of the work, the right to prepare derivative works, which are new works that incorporate material from an existing work, so an adaptation, um, the right to distribute copies of the work to the public, um, uh, the right to publicly perform the work, uh, if it's um, you know a, a music score or something of that sort, the right to publicly display the work that goes to works of visual art, and the right to perform sound recordings public publicly through digital audio transmission. That's uh, has to do with uh, musical recordings. Um, and uh, from these six rights, essentially, you get the entire universe of the, 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 the different ways in which uh, work of authorship is exploited. So within these six rights, that's the, the the second the right to create derivative works is what is implicated when you um, authorize uh, the 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 creation of an audiobook or when you when you um, when you give movie rights to somebody. So those are the six important rights that you have. Um, uh, uh, the 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 rights uh, there are some other requirements for copyright to exist. Um, just because you create something doesn't necessarily mean that there is copyright. The, the the specific requirement is that it has to be um, an original work um, that is fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Um, that means, which basically means that if uh, you um, uh, ideas are not protected, um, um, you know, just just uh, just sketches or ideas are not protected. It has there has to be sufficient uh, um, detailing of, of of the originality, and it has to be written down, recorded, or like exist in some sort of like tangible form. Um, so so that's uh, in, uh, uh, the same respect. Uh, something that is commonly used in a genre, for instance, like if you have a um, um, a, a fairy tale, and there's a princess in it. The princess would not be copyrightable because it's uh, it's called a scenes affair. So something that's very common is not considered original. Um, and copyright ownership can be can be the the entire thing can be transferred to another entity or person. Um, most common example of this is when you know, as Wudan mentioned, some people work as LLCs, and what they'll do is the copyright originates in the author, right? Um, it, there there is a requirement of a um, a human author, um, uh, and and then the author then transfers ownership in of that work to um, you know maybe to a corporate entity so copyright itself can be transferred uh, or individual rights within the copyright can be licensed through contract that's how most um, uh, writing transactions work so I, I hope I didn't confuse <laughs> too much or no that's great um, interestingly I you mentioned a number of different kinds of copyright so you know for dramatic, presentation or audio presentation. Um, it sounds like obviously those would apply more specifically to writers in, in certain industries. Um, is it generally more important you know, for, for people to retain their copyright in, in certain industries, you know, in, in playwriting versus journalism, for example, or is it, is it sort of good practice for everyone to always try to hold on to their copyright? That's a, that's a really good question. And that's a really interesting question. So I, I one, you know, copyright is is it, copyright is just the the right of the author, and and you know, author could mean uh, the law considers a playwright to be an author. The law considers someone writing a screenplay or some a music, uh, someone writing a musical score to be an author. So all, every all of those creators have copyright in their works, and then. Um, uh, in some industries, for instance, have uh, have um, um, you have created customs or conventions where you do transfer copyright. So the screenwriting is the is the biggest example where um, because of the unionization that happened in the, in the second half of the 20th century, um, uh, if you write a screenplay, you are you are essentially the employee of the TV 
you know, studio through the union that you're working for, Writers Guild of America, or, or I think there's a there's a few others. Um, and um, um, uh, so, uh, so, so, the, so as part of that bargaining process, you 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 since you're an employee. Uh, the, what what you create in the course of your employment is actually uh, the property of the employer, and they have complete copyright ownership of it. And this, um, act, I was going to touch on this, and I, I am a little bit further down the line, but I'll just mention it. Uh, this is uh, this comes out of the work for hire doctrine, which I'm sure and, and most of our um, audience here are familiar with. It's uh, a lot of, um, especially a lot of digital publications, a lot of freelance writers encounter work works for hire uh, contracts. Uh, and works for hire can arise in two situations. In one situation, it's by contract, which you probably have seen. And the second is through an employment relationship. So, um, uh, you know, I mean, you can debate the sort of merits of uh, whether or not, like as a screenwriter, how how it works to, to you know, give complete copyright ownership into your work to someone else. Um, but the industry has sort of come up with an equilibrium where where those writers get uh, healthcare benefits and other union benefits in exchange for that. Um, I, you know, as, as, as I think like if you're a freelance writer, there may be certain, um, you know, certain industries, like if you're writing web copy, um, and again, like it is entirely negotiable. Um, but if you're, if you're writing web copy for a very specific niche, um, 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 business like like a mattress brand or something like that, something that you 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 don't you you wouldn't otherwise use in your work. Uh, then you know you might say, okay, you know, I'll make this as a work for hire. It makes sense for the for the company that's hiring me to have ownership of this. I'm I'm really just creating this this product for them. And in that respect, you can um, you know negotiate an upfront uh, services fee and and divest yourself from 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 those rights. Um, but if you're a journalist, and I see this a lot in digital media, uh, which is really unfortunate because, um, you know, uh, uh, the the print media, um, if you're if, if, you, if the same publication might have a bifurcated system where if you're writing for their digital channel, uh, they might send you a work for hire and a complete copyright assignment uh, contract versus if you're if you're publishing in their print um, um, uh, magazine, they'll um, have like a three month exclusivity period after which you get the rights. And, and uh, you know, I mean, if you're in if you're a journalist, that's very important because you can uh, you know you can you can use that piece in an anthology, or you can create a podcast out of it, or you can um, you know uh, there's there's so many there's so many other licensing uh, opportunities now for for those works. Uh, people are really looking for stories um, that you really don't want to um, you know create give give up your rights in uh, you know a five thousand word investigative journalism piece, and I've seen that happen quite quite frequently, unfortunately. So um, so so. Um, I'm I'm not sure if I answered your question or just sort of <laughs> veered in directions. Yeah, no, that's really interesting that that you've seen this sort of this two pronged system. You know, I I think as as many journalists have experienced, there's definitely a difference in a lot of a lot of kind of legacy print uh, pop publications where there is this kind of line between digital and print, and you know the pay is often much lower for the digital publication, even though they're running a lot more. You know, the print magazine is shrunk to something very small, whereas the digital presence is huge, but it's it's not reflected in in the contracts. But I hadn't I hadn't thought about copyright being part of that as well. That's really something I mean, to be arbitrary. Um, yeah, I mean, you you. you I, I think that's why it's so important to really carefully read the contract, especially now. Um, uh, you know, a lot of digital media outlets are um, are 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 looking at for ways to sort of become um, you know multi-channel content providers. So uh, you know, because they've seen how lucrative the podcast uh, space is, or how lucrative the um, even like short web documentary spaces. So so with that in mind. Uh, you know, freelance writers will 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 start seeing contracts where the the digital media outlets they're writing for they're not just asking for rights to, um, you know, publish the work. I mean, even if they're letting you retain the copyright, they might be asking for a more expansive grant of rights. Uh, and and so you should look at it. You should think about like how. Uh, giving up, you know, the audio rights would impact you. I mean, is this something that that you can, you know, better exploit on your own or work with someone else? So, so all of those questions are, 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 you know, getting even more relevant, the questions of the scope of 
um, copyright and the, and the grants of individual rights. I think that's an important point to bring up is that, you know, if these publications, if these, these media companies are seeing more value in these other methods of, of dissemination, audio, video, et cetera, you know, a lot of writers should probably take it upon themselves to see the value in it as well. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think that's that's what was great about the the you know with Dan's uh, um, comments too. And and really, it's it's hard. I, as a writer, I also understand you know you're constantly undervaluing your work, and it's and 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 both that and also there's like no real um, empirical reference point for writers to really think about how much they should uh, be getting paid for something. But but I I. I th I, I think that writers should kind of like think more about what, how instrumental their piece is in kind of these downstream sort of uh, um, um, channels. Um, you know, the the publication wants the piece because they want the story, and you know that that the story that the writer has worked on and given is given expression to. Uh, and without that expression, because you can have an idea, right? Like ideas are not copyrightable, but without that that particular expression, you don't get those uh, uh, adaptations. You don't get those short, you know, documentaries. Also, you know, um, it's hard to uh, really put a number on it. But uh, if you write a piece that's very popular, um, you know, you're 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 getting you're generating a lot of good ad revenue for the. Uh, publication and um, you know that that could be something you take the next time you submit something to 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 you know increase your rates I know there's some arrangements where some publications give um, the authors uh, um, a, a percentage of the ad revenues but you know there's so many ways you can negotiate 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 <laughs> seems like that's a that's a theme coming up and it's actually a great segue to our next panelist so I'm gonna say goodbye for now we'll see you again in a, in a little while at the Q&A session but uh, for now, I'm going to bring on Ryan Goldberg, who is a, a longtime freelance journalist. He's also a member of the Freelance Solidarity Project's organizing committee, and they've been doing a lot of really interesting work on contracts and negotiations. So let's get Ryan in and we'll we'll get talking. Hi, Ryan. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. Thank you. Um, so before we get into uh, what uh, elaborating on what Umer and Wudan have talked about. Can you just tell us a little bit about FSP and how it came about, how you came to the project and sort of your, your career path? Sure, so the Freelance Solidarity Project um, was started by a group of digital media workers in really in the beginning of the spring of 2018. Um, some of these workers, I was not included. I was not um, in, I was not in sort of the original group, but I joined soon after. But um, these folks basically had worked in digital media newsrooms, had been in sort of part of the wave of unionization in a lot of media, uh, digital media uh, uh, newsrooms. And they felt like, you know, that freelancers shouldn't be left out of that equation. And it really started with sort of two main principles. One was as freelancers to kind of stand in solidarity with unionized workers in other newsrooms, digital and print. And in addition, that freelancers should be able to collectively bargain themselves. And I think they recognize, and certainly myself and other members of, as we've joined, recognize that the media industry is incredibly volatile. Um, as Wudan mentioned, you know, it's also an industry that has been declining. And uh, in many of our careers, we will never be in one position. So we will be freelance, we'll be staff, we might be permalance, and we will oftentimes cycle through those jobs. So it's really important to band together and recognize the challenges that we're all facing. I joined the Freelance Solidarity Project not long after that, and then I ran for the organizing committee in November of 2020. And this was our second organizing committee. The first one was the core group of people who helped to establish it. And our membership has just continued to grow. My own background is that I've been a freelance journalist since 2008. So yeah, 13 years, it feels like a very, very long time. So I've seen a lot of different things in the industry over the years. Predominantly, I've been a, a sort of investigative reporter for print and digital outlets, but I've also written for television, written for film, um, written for, um, uh, documentaries and I feel like I've seen a lot of things a lot of practices that are actually quite good outside of media that I think 
the media industry um, you know, needs to do better on. And so personally, I kind of feel like I've been able to bring that a little bit to our organizing work at uh, FSP. That's really interesting. I think one of the things about FSP that really strikes me is that it's digital media workers. It's not just writers. I think maybe that, and maybe you can speak to whether that sort of cross, uh, you know, cross position, cross in, cross um, discipline approach has helped people share some some other kinds of information. You know, maybe illustrators are getting certain kinds of deals that writers aren't, or or video editors are. And being able is it is being able to share that information across across the table, so to speak, been valuable. Yeah, it's it's really valuable. We have photographers, we have illustrators, like you said, editors, writers. Um, it's really an amazing kind of group of people, and I think most importantly, being able to stand in solidarity with others. And 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 many times in an assignment that I might get as a writer, there is also going to be a freelance photographer involved in it, maybe a freelance editor. And so knowing what they're being paid, knowing what I'm being paid, um, those things are all really important and kind of sharing that information with each other. So um, I sort of left out, but FSP, when it was started, you know, ultimately freelancers can't have their own union. And so we um, ultimately decided to sort of join the National Writers Union, which has been around since 1981. And NWU has like a really great history and legacy of, of fighting for, um, for freelance writers and other media workers, for getting like back pay, for fighting for grievance campaigns, and also sort of negotiating um, what they call letters of agreement, which has kind of been one of our big things with FSP is to actually be working with publications and trying to get them to publicize sort of standards for freelancers. So that's something that I really wanted to get into because I think that is such an important piece that's missing for so many people. What, what, a, what a standard contract can and should look like for freelancers. You know, Umer was talking about how we've got these different standards for people at the same company, whether it's digital or print. And that's just crazy. Like, and if you were only on the digital side, you'd never know that that was the case because freelancers are so siloed. What are some of the things that, that uh, FSP is working on to sort of standardize in those letters of agreement? Are there specific terms that you sort of request or require? Yeah, we have a sort of gold standard agreement, which I would say so far, I think maybe two publications have asked us for that, and then we've been able to provide it for them. Um, those are Pipe Wrench and also Defector Media, two relatively new um, digital media outlets. And the letters of agreement, um, I think what's so important about them is that as freelancers, we really ex uh, exist in sort of a very opaque space, and we sort of operate oftentimes uh, as individuals and lacking the transparency, as you said, of what others are getting. So with the letters of agreement, I think, you know, there are some real staples that we are constantly pushing for. One is really good indemnification language so that the, that, you know, most contracts that you often get say that you will indemnify the publication when of course it should be the other way around, like you're doing the work. And especially if it's reporting that is gonna uh, ruffle some feathers, it should be the publication that is agreeing to indemnify you and pay your legal bills and support you under their, uh, you know, insur media ins liability insurance. So that's one big thing. I think a second thing too that, um, so we've had three letters of agreement or unilateral announcements as we've also been calling them come out. Um, the first one was with the Intercept and then the other two were with High Branch and Defector. And so one thing that Defector included in theirs, which we think was really great and which we've been pushing for, especially around the pandemic, is graduated payment. So as a freelancer, especially as a freelance writer, it's so ludicrous when you tell this to people outside of journalism, but that you will only be paid when your story, the standard is you will only be paid when your story is published. So you could take an assignment and maybe it's six months or a year before it comes out and you won't even get paid then, you will get paid 30 days maybe or even 60 days if the publication is a bit of a deadbeat uh, from when that story comes out. And so how can you actually sort of do this as you're living as a career if that's how long you have to wait to get paid for the work you do. So the def um, defector included a graduated payment in their 
agreement, which is in this case, you'll be paid 50% when you turn the first draft and then 50% upon publication. So that's a really big thing we're pushing for as well. And then I think um, maybe the sort of third thing is really around um, IP and copyright, you know, and just making sure that these agreements you know, hand over the copyright to the contributor um, instead of, you know, keeping it for themselves. You mentioned indemnification as being as being one of the issues that you that you are working on trying to secure for people. Are there any other kind of like red flags that people should be looking out for when they're reading their contracts? You know, like if the indemnification isn't in there, you know, be, be aware of what that could really mean for you. It could be quite a big deal. Is there anything else that people might let slip by that they really should should read closely in a contract? Well, I do think um, Umer talked about this. Um, the work for hire for me is sort of the number one red flag. If And that's something that's becoming more prevalent, especially for publications I'm sure that we all read and maybe we all love. Uh, and I've seen that firsthand is that the contracts that they've given me have been work for hire and that's becoming more common. And I think that's the number one red flag. If you can't control your, if you don't own the right that you're pitching to the publication, um, you know, like like the mayor said, you know, oftentimes the sort of they will have a first exclusive right for maybe three months. But if they're going to be holding your your work forever, that means not only that you may not you may miss out on the opportunity to perhaps like option your work for something else. It also means like you might not be able in some cases to report on the same thing again. Some of these contracts will say that they basically own your reporting. Um, and so as someone, you know, as any freelancer who maybe specializes in a certain subject area, to give that up would be madness. So that's really, I think the number one red flag is the work for hire. Uh, personally, I try to never sign a work for hire deal. Um, I think the second thing is the indemnification language. I think maybe the third thing is, you know, something uh, sort of seemingly simple, but kill fees. You know, some contracts will not have kill fees in them. And the kill fee for anyone who may not know is basically if a publication decides not to publish your work, that they will pay, you know, after you've done the work, after you've say submitted your first draft that, or even later drafts, but they decide not to publish it or, or um, print it, that you will be paid a certain amount uh, for the work that you've already done and that it's not being published really to no fault of your own. Yeah, that's something that I think uh, along the lines of not getting paid until something publishes, I think that's something that also can really shock a lot of people outside of writing in that you could do all your work. You can do your work exactly as contracted, turn it in, and then because the publication makes a decision that, you know, actually the May issue, we're going in a different direction, we're going to focus on this topic, we don't need this story anymore. They could just drop it and and if you don't have a kill fee in place, you're just out, right? You, you get nothing. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's totally wild. Um, that's really something that's important to think about. <laughs> have you sort of personally, because you've been a, a journalist for so long, have you had any kind of horror stories along those lines, worked for something, worked on something for a year and then not made any of your money back or any other stories you want to share? <laughs> um, I've had, I've certainly had a few instances where one story I can think of that, um, you know, the editor kept telling me it was going to be published any day now, or that I was going to go into fact checking any day and then be published. And then said, okay, I'm putting through an invoice for you for the full amount. You know, just uh, it'll be published any day. And then months later, she just said, we, we decided not to run the piece. Um, normally we pay a kill fee, but in this case, we're going to pay you in full. And I said, well, you already told me you processed my invoice three months ago for the full amount. So you're going to pay for the full amount. And, you know, I did publish that story elsewhere. I, I don't think this this is a story that wasn't quite a horror story, but maybe could have been. Um, I and, and it relates to indemnification. I was sued for defamation by a really angry uh, subject of a story I wrote for the website Deadspin in 2016. And the lawsuit, I was sued 364 days after the story came out, so one day before the statute of limitations expired, and. Um, Gizmodo Media Group, which owned Deadspin at the time, um, which was owned by Univision, they um, backed me and indemnified me and paid all my legal bills and had the greatest counsel. However, the contract, as I went back and looked at it, that I had signed with them originally, didn't have any mention whatsoever of indemnification. And so certainly, you know, a publication um, could have maybe said, although it would have been a really bad look for them, 
that we're not going to defend you. Of course they did, but something like that was, you know, in that moment sort of nerve wracking as I went through to see what I had actually signed a year earlier. That's a really good lesson for people is to do the reading before you get sued. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think that's a really great segue to our final panelist. So I'm going to say goodbye, Ryan, for now. We'll see you in a little bit. Um, and we're going to move on. Our last panelist is Rob Hartley, who is the co-founder of Dinghy, who offers uh, writer insurance for freelance writers. Rob, hi, how are you doing? Hi, Reagan. Yeah, good to see you. Well, thank hey, you. Thanks for joining us. So Ryan's story, I think, is a perfect example of yeah. where liability insurance can really come in because, you know, he, he had he had a, a publication that was generous enough to provide him with the coverage that, that wasn't actually even in the contract. But I think a lot of people are not necessarily so lucky. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about how liability insurance kind of steps in and what it does? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, Ryan was lucky and, and thank you, Ryan, for leading in so nicely into our segment. The, uh, it's a liability insurance does exactly what, um, Ryan mentioned there, so primarily covering your defense costs. So most of the cost of liability insurance is around defense costs. So even if you've done nothing wrong, someone can still allege it. And as Ryan said, it can take them a year before they actually bring that bring that claim. And then you need to start finding lawyers to defend you against that, that process. So the first thing and foremost is, is defense cost. And then um, what it's defending you against is the allegation that you've done something in your professional service or given some advice that's caused a loss to a financial loss to another client or a customer. Now, what you normally find with professional liability is it it doesn't then extend to the media. So um, you've got to be very careful. To, again, read always read what you're given before you pay for it or sign it. You'll find that there's some companies who will be offering what they call writer insurance, and it will be professional liability insurance, which is this defending you against the financial loss to another third party. But it excludes things like libel and slander, copyright infringement, the things that writers really need. Um, and then there's a, so that, that's what we call professional liability. And the other half of uh, liability insurance for freelancers is general liability, which is where you may cause uh, injury to someone else or damage to their property. Uh, most easy way to think about it is if you spill coffee over a computer in a client's office, um, and damage that computer, then that could be covered by your general liability insurance. Yeah, I think the the point you brought up in that media liability is really hard to find. Um, that's definitely something that we experienced. You know, Freelancers Union, I'm sure many of our, our viewers know, we have a history of offering freelancers access to insurance products. Uh, you know, all the sorts of things that you would have available to you if you were on staff somewhere. Um, but because you're a freelancer, you're building your own your own business and your own business protection. Um, so we obviously, health insurance has been a part of our business for a long time, but things like uh, disability insurance, life insurance, and business insurance, so, so professional liability. Um, and for a long time, you know, we've had a great partner on the liability side, but they don't, they don't do media. They don't do media liability. They won't cover writers. And our experience in talking to many other companies is was exactly the same they they refuse to touch it <laughs> i think there's a real fear from insurance companies about what what can happen in media and it feels a little bit risky to touch um so what's your experience in, in creating a dinghy to cover exactly this what was your thinking and, and how was your understanding of that risk <laughs> well it's, it's exactly that rigging it's understanding that risk and having that confidence that it you understand that marketplace, you've been there before. So my experience of insurance, I've been working over 20 years uh, in the US and in the UK and other exciting, exotic places. Uh, and once you've just, you know, in my experience in the US and working with our, our insurance partner in the US, who's got experience in this area, it, they, we've got that comfort and we understand the, the risk that writers face and we feel comfortable with, with that media liability. And it isn't something you have to necessarily exclude. It's just that if people haven't got the comfort, they won't. They won't look at it. Um, and and uh, I think you just, yeah, as I said earlier, you just got to be careful because people who put out their writer's insurance products without actually having that media liability is, is is an issue. And the reason we started with writers in the U.S. So we we launched in the U.K. Uh, four years ago. We we only just come across to the U.S. Um, last October. 
And we focus primarily on writers because of that gap in the market, because that media liability isn't readily available. And also that the buying process is so painful. Um, you know, it's, it's still very much an offline process in the US, it's very paper driven. It takes even even the, the ones that are bringing insurance online, that's putting very lengthy forms online. At, at the end, it goes, thanks for your submission. Someone will write back to you about it. And you can go through weeks of trying to get a price. And then when you do, it's something much higher than you would want to pay. So we've got the expertise, the digital platform capability to bring that process, streamline it, make it more efficient and bring the coverage that the writers need. Uh, and uh, just to give a nod to our group CEO over here, he's actually a professional writer. Um, so if you look up James Twining, he, uh, he, he's actually a published author. And you know, so it's a very passionate thing for him as well in terms of you know, supporting writers and making sure we get the right products uh, out to, to the market. Because you launched in the UK, I know the liability landscape there is quite different for journalists. Um, and there's a lot of kind of different um, restrictions and, and laws that they need to be aware of. What's the experience been like for, for Dinghy um, in the UK versus the US? I know it's only been since October, although that was six months ago now. I know, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's crazy. It's been six months and we still haven't been able to, to sit down together and celebrate the launch. I think. <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully it'll be a summer party we can do. Um, yeah, the experience is, uh, the, I think the risks are the same. You know, it, there is that the, the copyright infringement risk where you might write an article that you've written yourself, but someone else might believe it's so similar to theirs. Um, and you, even if you've done nothing wrong, just the defense costs can be quite, quite high. Um, or you can just make silly mistakes. You know, we, we, we all do them. But if, say, you're creating an article and you put a, you're putting images in, you could leave a, a, a photo stock, you know, stock image that you're supposed to update and you forget. That goes into a magazine, that magazine gets run, and then you've got to rerun all of the costs of that magazine article. So the, the, the risks are the same. And I think what's interesting is actually the, the freelancers, what they, the experiences of insurance is the same. Um, I think as, um, you know, as we've been talking about in the, the panel, people fall into freelancing a lot of the times. So they don't, you know, some, some people choose it as a profession, they come out of a uh, of school or university and they, they go straight into it but others get let let go by an employer and they stumble into it and they're like okay I, can, I know I can write or I know I can build websites but they don't uh, have this experience of buying insurance or being a business and that, and that um, so what we Dan was talking about earlier about you know setting yourself up as a business it is really key and insurance is a key part of that but the challenge is it's very it's very difficult to understand as a as a you know a layman who doesn't you know I've worked in it for so long it's it's too easy to understand but I, we try and make that process a lot easier so that's the feedback we we got from the UK was we, we take a complicated process and make it simple and that's the and that's the that's all our ethos here so we're trying to make this simple process for writers and and that's the feedback we're getting so the people who are using our site that every time we ask you know, what can you give us feedback positive or negative it's always coming back as this is really simple and it's much easier than I thought it would be. And thank you <laughs> uh, for, for making it transparent. And, and, you know, we're always trying to iterate as well. We're trying to make it easier. So if people do get quotes and they have challenges, they ask us questions. We then we then feed that back into our development and try and improve the, the product to make it fit. In terms of process, obviously the the quote and purchase process is is really easy and streamlined. What happens when somebody, let's take Ryan's example, you know, somebody is served a letter, right? They, they're they're getting sued. They don't, you know, they maybe weren't aware of this. They they didn't know it was coming. They get this letter in the mail. Oh my God, what do I do now? If they have, you know, dinghy writer insurance, what's what what's the process? How does that work? Yeah, great question. The, the first thing is is not to panic. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it is going to happen at some point in your career, like Ryan, like Ryan experienced, and I'm sure there was a lot of panic uh, on Ryan's side when that happened. Um, but and and then it's the first thing is not panic, and then reach out to your insurer. Um, so we our, our website, we we've got a self service area, so you can sign in and go straight through your own. You know, you can file a claim at midnight. It will then go picked up by uh, the the claims handlers, who then they are the experts. And so the, the, the worst thing you can do is think you can look after it yourself because you will make it worse. And, you know, or, or you think, oh, I'll, I'll pass it to my friendly lawyer who I know and they'll write something in, in response because if they're not experts, it can, it can go wrong. So the, the first thing is don't panic. 
don't even necessarily respond to them, acknowledge it, pass it straight across to your insurance carrier and let them start talking directly with your with, with the claimant. Um, and because they've got the experience, they know the questions to ask and to make sure they don't push it and make, you know, you're not admitting any liability unless you've actually done something wrong and that comes out through the process. I think that's a, it's a good lesson in a, a lot of freelance writing is sort of put yourself forward as the expert or, or figure it out yourself. You know, journalists, their whole job is to figure out how to do it themselves, figure out what the, what the issue is. But sometimes you should let the professionals handle it. <laughs> yeah, with insurance, definitely. Yeah, I'm all, I'm all for finding out, you know, finding things out for yourself, working it all out for yourself. But when it comes to uh, financial matters, uh, I've always used accountants. I've always used uh, uh, other other financial experts to tell me what to do with with things. I, I haven't got every time in the day to do everything. So, and it's the same with insurance. So if you if you get a claim in, don't panic. Just give it straight to your insurance carrier, um, and, and and let them deal with it. So I think now we're going to take a few minutes. Uh, we're coming up to the hour, but I want to bring everybody back on so we can all chat together. Maybe get to a few questions for the group. So I'm just going to bring everybody back in, and we'll. We'll wrap up with a couple of questions for everybody. Here we are. Hi, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. Um, I think one of the themes that really came up in everybody's uh, conversation was negotiating and what you can negotiate for yourself, whether it's you know uh, pay, whether it's contract terms like copyright or indemnification. Um, in sort of in general, uh, for people who maybe don't feel like they've got that negotiation muscle built up yet, do you have any tips for people to sort of approach that conversation or sort of think ways to think about the conversation ahead of time to give them a little bit of, of confidence? Um, one thing I would say really quickly is that I think it helps in terms of um, maybe knowing what I know. Many publications I found they do have good uh, contract language. They just don't want to give it to you right away. And so, if you ask for it, it often might just take one simple question like, "Can you do better on this uh, indemnification language, or can you do better on this, um, you know, copyright language?" And they'll say, "Oh, yeah, actually, we have another contract for that. We'll send that one to you." So. Um, you know, I do think though it does help to maybe know what you may want to counter with. So if you say, if you know this doesn't look good, be able to say, you know, can you do better or can you do this? And say, instead of work for hire, how about three month, you know, first right exclusive window. And in terms of indemnification language, kind of doing your due diligence to know what a good indemnification language would be to insert so that at least you can kind of come back with and say, this is good language and can you do this? Right. Yeah. And, and to that, I would just say, I mean, if you the the, the writing world is kind of unique in, 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 in the, this respect where it's, the you know, even though, um, I guess, technically speaking, the, the contracts are negotiated, um, there's just very little bargaining power, um, you know, that a writer has often going in and you get a form contract. Uh, and the person that you're talking to at the publication may not, you know, I mean, they're often not lawyers. Sometimes they're just editors and they just have this protocol of like, this is the first contract I sent out. If I get these responses, this is what I counter with. Um, but, you know, these are all very reasonable, um, you know, changes uh, that, that I think publications understand that they uh, have to uh, grant if they want to continue getting good talent, um, and and you know just just know that the publication needs your work. Um, um, you know, even if it's good work, you can you can always go somewhere else too. Yeah, I was going to chime in and say that in my experience, a lot of editors have no idea what better language looks like. And so freelancers need to provide that language. That's a huge reason why uh, through the Writers Co-op, we created a contracts course um, because it tells it tells you exactly, in essence, what to look for, like what a good um, what what a good licensing agreement looks like, which is not a work for hire. Um, when a work for hire is even appropriate, I think we all need to go into these negotiations knowing what what our walkway point is, right? Like if this is a feature that could turn into a book, um, obviously if somebody can't push, uh, can't can't meet you halfway on rights, like that's probably a done deal 
move on. Um, you can't get everything. Like I, I think that's why I say go into every negotiation knowing what matters the most to you. Right. And same token, I just want to say the, the Authors Guild also has, uh, we review contracts. So if you become an Authors Guild member, um, you can send in your contract and one of our lawyers will look at it and suggest changes that you can go back to, um, uh, you know, your editor with. And I believe the, um, the agreements that FSP has worked out with Defector and The Intercept are avail publicly available. Is that right, Ryan? Yeah, they're available. Um, we've like tweeted them out, but they're also available on the websites of the publications. So that's Ooh. another great place for people to look is sort of right. read what those gold yeah. standard terms are and, and see what they can apply to their own negotiation. Yeah, that's a great point. It's kind of why we hope and, you know, we're working on a bunch more agreements now. And it's in part because, you know, we're trying to almost like shame publications, you know, to live up to maybe their progressive ideals that they espouse. Well, you know, they don't want to, they shouldn't feel, they shouldn't be left behind when it comes to like publicizing, you know, their very ethical treatment and fair treatment of freelancers. Well, I, we're at five o'clock already. Time really flies. Uh, so I don't want to keep anybody beyond their, beyond their time. I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, this has been a great conversation. I hope it's been really helpful to everybody who's tuned in. Um, this video is going to be on our YouTube channel afterwards. So, you know, anybody who came in halfway through or, you know, maybe missed it, it'll be there for you. We'll be, we'll be here to talk whenever you're ready. Um, and obviously, you know, anybody who's watching who has further questions should absolutely check in with any and all of our panelists, depending on, on what your question's about. The Authors Guild is a fabulous resource. FSP is a wonderful resource. The Writers Co-op is a fantastic resource. If you haven't listened to the podcast, go back. There's two seasons you can listen to. Join the join the Patreon club. You know, get in there. Um, and Freelancers Union obviously is another resource for you. We're all here to answer your questions. Um, I know Rob is personally responding to questions from from people who are interested in liability insurance. So if you if you write if you write to Dingy, if you've got questions about that, you will probably hear from Rob himself, Rob or James, who's the other who's the president, who's also a book author. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us um, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.